Gandhi, historical figure most of you are familiar with, was actually intimately familiar with Christianity. He saw a lot of it and uh, wasn't that impressed. There's a famous quote that he gave. He said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Now, we don't know exactly what Gandhi's view of Jesus was. People tend to make up their own views of Jesus based on their own ideas, and sometimes they're not biblical. But I'm afraid that a lot of times we know in our souls that he had a point. We are not like Jesus Christ. We are called as citizens of heaven, born into the heavenly family, into the heavenly kingdom, and we are sent into this world as ambassadors for Christ. But so often our heart passions are for the things of this world. That can be financial things, that can be sinful things, evil things, it can be political things, it can be hobbies, sports, anything, but our deepest passions tend to be the things of this world. We love the world and the things in the world, even though John said that we ought not do that. Jesus said that his disciples would be known by their love and their unity, and that that would prove to the world the reality of Christ and that he came from the Father. The church of Jesus Christ today is hardly known in this world for its love or its unity. Children of God bite and devour each other. We go on social media in public and we tear each other apart. Many churches today, I might even say the majority of Christian churches are torn apart by division and the world looks at us and does not see the love of Christ. I'm not saying us uh, so much as the church of Jesus Christ, the American church. I'm afraid that very often we, the church, the Christian church, are poor advertisements for our perfect Savior. Now, as we continue to dwell, delve into our study of the book of Job, which I've called When Hell Boils Over, when evil comes our way in this world and how we respond I'm afraid as we look today and begin to look at the response of the three friends of Job, I think what we can see from them is that too often we as believers don't respond like the people of God. We, content, we condemn those three friends. We always look at the sinners in the Bible and we say, oh, they're terrible. But when we look at, for instance, how the Pharisees behaved, the Fer so much of modern American Christianity, I'm afraid, would fit in really well with the New Testament Pharisees. We don't like to admit that, but we would be very comfortable with the way they were. So many would. We're blind to our own spiritual failings, just like Job's friends. And we need to ask God to open our eyes so that we can stop looking with condemning eyes at others and examine ourselves. We continue with this series, and today we begin looking at what I've called Three's Blind Advice. This section in chapter 4, it actually goes through, verse 20, through chapter 27. Uh, today we're just going to examine, hopefully, chapters 4 through 14. Uh, it consists of three rounds of debate that follow the lament on Job in Job 3 that we looked at two weeks ago. And in this debate, first of all, after Job gave his lament, uh, in, in, this, in this debate time, uh, what we have is three cycles of debate. In these three cycles... Uh, Eliphaz speaks, then Job speaks, then Bildad speaks, then Job speaks, then Zophar speaks, then Job speaks again. 
it's very patterned, and then they go a second time, and then they go a third time. Now, what we're going to do today is we're not going to go verse by verse through each of those. We would, uh, they're very repetitive. Job will say the same thing 15 times, and then in his next speech, he'll say the same things over and over. Uh, the friends do as well. So what I'm going to do is kind of glean the highlights and look at the three friends as one, even though they have unique personalities. Eliphaz is very educated and refined. He's very proud of his wisdom. You can almost imagine he talks like this. I am a, a man of wisdom. Bill Dad, I call him the blowhard, or the blustery guy. He's filled with cliches. He, you know, he, he, he says, keep a stiff upper lip. And, you know, he's always got a cliche generally taken out of context. And Zophar is the zealous one. He's, you know, he's, he's dogmatic. He's, he's got all the answers, and that's the way that he is. Each of them has a slightly different personality, but they are, uh, you know, they, they work together to kind of form a team. And so what we'll do is we'll look at their responses to Job's lament and then Job's responses to their criticisms, and we'll look at those as kind of a group. Um, and I think that's probably the best way. Now, a little bit of review, because some of you haven't, haven't been here. I don't know how many are, are faithful in looking at the, uh, the videos, but I just want to kind of set it up. The, and once again, please understand how I'm saying this. The whole setup of the book of Job is about when God sins. Now, once again, God doesn't sin. Our God is a perfect God. Sin is defined as acting contrary to the character, nature, and commands of God. So God can't sin. But Job had a view of God that said God is supposed to act this way. God is supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And God didn't. Job, Job's view of God was flawed. And so God didn't act like Job thought he would and should. And so in Job 19, 6, this is one of the key verses in all of Job. He says, then understand that it is God who has wronged me. God wronged me. I'm right, God is wrong. Can you imagine saying that? He has caught me in his net. I'm right, God's wrong. God has sinned, God has done wrong. And the question that we're addressing is, will your view of God and your relationship with God survive 2020? Will it survive the tsunami of life? Will it survive when hell boils over and attacks you? Um, and that's really the key issue that we're dealing with. Uh, I said, a, I kind of overview, gave an overview of all of this last week, and uh, I, I set aside kind of five levels or five stages in this conflict, and the key question is, when such times come, if you have a, a view of God shaped by the truth, by biblical truth, and you have a close walk with him, you can walk through in victory and peace and joy, but if your view of God is unbiblical, if it's flawed, it'll all fall apart. Now what I want to do is look at, once again, we're just going to talk about the first three stages. Initial victory, that was when Job said, uh, that was the other, it's not a, technically a hymn, Jerry, but we sing that one all the time, blessed be his name in the landmark with suffering. Uh, that was, that's another song that comes right out of the book of Job. Uh, and he's right, I know my Redeemer lives, comes right out of one of the later chapters. We may look at that in a couple of weeks. Uh, there's that time of initial victory. No matter what came Job's way, he said, uh, blessed be the name of the Lord, he rejoiced. And then there was that time of numbness where he sat for seven days and seven nights, chapter two, sat there in silence, not uttering a word. And then we have the period of lament, the confusion uh, he's, he's lashing out, and that's what we see. The first cycle, chapters 4, his lament in chapter 3, and then cycle 4 through 14, is really an examination of this lament. And what you see during all three of these cycles is a gradual escalation. Have you ever started discussing something with someone? I'm sure this has never happened to you. But it starts out and you're just having a, you know, an easygoing discussion and you know, back and forth, and then all of a sudden you notice that the temperature in the room is rising a little bit. 
and it's getting more and more, you know, sweat is beating on your forehead and the temperature's rising, and all of a sudden you're shouting at one another, or at least your blood is boiling. Well, that's what starts to happen here. In, uh, in, you know, in the first session, they start out in Eliphaz's speech. He's just sort of making hints and insinuations. By the time Zophar gives his speech, there's accusations being thrown against Job. And by the second and third rounds, you know, they're throwing mud at one another. And it's hostile. It's, it's angry. They're, they're in a, a major fight. And so we're going to look at the friends and what they said, and we're going to look at Job and what he said. It's interesting to look at the personalities of the three friends and how it's different, but I don't really want to go in there. Right now, I think it's best to take the three of them together. I want to, as briefly as I'm able, um, look at, look at uh, the views of the three friends as one as kind of one look here. Um, whoever's back there, this thing is, it's, oh, there it goes, finally started working again. It's, maybe, I'm, maybe I need to change my battery in the clicker. We'll see about that. But uh, anyhow, the friends respond. There is this gradual escalation, and let's look at six things they did. The first one, and the key one, is they misapplied truth. Have you ever been to the doctor? And the doctor diagnoses you. That's the first thing the doctor does. We, we, our doctor just retired. And I, I'm, I'm sorry about that because one of the things she was really good at was diagnosing what was wrong with you. And, uh, and that's such a key. Because there's wonderful medicines out there, but if they give you the wrong medicine for your illness, it won't work. They can give you a perfectly wonderful medicine, but if they have a wonderful antibiotic and you have a virus, it won't help because it's the wrong medicine for the wrong disease. And that's what happens along a, a lot of times. Look, there is almost nothing in the speeches of the three friends that is false. Almost every word that they spoke was true in a certain context. You read through their speeches, and they, they weren't speaking lies. They were just misapplying the truth. The Word of God is true, and it's perfect. They just applied it wrongly. Now, have you ever heard a phrase like, you can't outgive God? You can't outgive God. It's basically a, a biblical truth. God loves us a, a generous giver, a cheerful giver. W with whatever measure you, you measure, it will be measured back to you. You know, if you give generously, God will, you, you'll reap generously. Those are biblical principles. But a, a principle like that can be applied wrongly. I've heard televangelist types turn that into some kind of a, a, an investment guarantee. If, if you give me, they call it sowing a seed. If you give me a little bit, God will give you a lot. Hey, great investment. Give me a hundred dollars, God will give you a thousand. And that's that's a that's taking a truth and turning it into a falsehood by applying it wrongly. Uh, some people take this and turn it into a falsehood by by in, in by implying that God's treasures are only measured in gold and silver. Proverbs over and over says that God's treasures are greater than silver and gold. You can't measure the riches of heaven in a bank account. And so when it says that God, you know, you'll reap generously, it doesn't just mean your bank account. So if you apply that truth to say if you give generously, you're going to get rich, you're taking a truth and making it a lie. Do you understand the point that I'm making? And that's what these guys did over and over and over again. In Job 4, 7, Eliphaz asserted, the innocent don't perish, do not perish. Well, in context, that's true. God is fair and just. And in a sense, you could say there's no one innocent, there's none righteous, no, not one. But God doesn't pour out his judgment on innocent people. God poured out his judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. God poured out his judgment 
on Ananias and Sapphira. God is a righteous judge. But in a fallen world, in a wicked world, even innocent people can get hit by drunk drivers. Even righteous people and good people can get cancer. There's no automatic protection from the evils of this world. In verse 17 of chapter 4, he said, mortal man cannot be righteous for God before God, and this is true. We can't be righteous before God. But what he was insinuating was, Job, you're not righteous. He makes a pa passive-aggressive accusation in chapter 5, verse 2. He says, anger kills a fool. Does anger kill a fool? Anger is one of the most destructive things that you can live with. If you're living with anger, if there is deep anger in your soul, it's poison. It's probably worse for your soul than, than most diseases can be. But he's hinting there that Job was that fool and that his anger is what's killing him, what's causing the judgment of God. He is a doctor of the soul making bad diagnoses and so, I mean, this happens over and over again in here. They were constantly diagnosing the wrong disease. Second thing is, these guys were arrogant and overconfident. I heard a preacher one time at the Southern Baptist Convention, he say, I have been often wrong, but never in doubt. It's kind of a toxic combination, isn't it? I've been often wrong, but never in doubt. Remember that word, ultra-crepidarian? I shared that a, a few months ago. I can't remember exactly what sermon it was in. Ultra, I think it was in the, the beginning of the study in Revelation. Ultra crepidarian means people who are experts on things they don't really know anything about. We are living in a world of people who are medical ultra crepidarians. We think we know more than doctors and medical experts about medicine. When it comes to COVID, there's a lot of ultra-crepidarians out there who think they know everything and the experts know nothing. I'm not trying to get into that debate, but I'm just saying that people say, well, I know exactly what's going on, and even experts don't always know what's going on. That's the way we, and these guys are moral ultra-crepidarians. They think they're experts even when they're not. And they thought they knew exactly what was true and what Job had done wrong and how they could fix things. And they're wrong about everything. They're so wrong that in the end, God judges them. God, God rebukes them. At the close of his speech, in chapter 5, Eliphaz, and remember, you can almost hear him saying it in a voice like this, we have investigated it, this, and it is true. Hear it and understand it for yourself. One of those people that has these crazy theories and says, do the research. Ever known someone like that? Had these wacko theories, you know, about a flat earth. They said, just do the research. Because they looked it up on YouTube or the internet and they found somebody that said that. And they said, do the research. Job 5.27. Do the research. We know what we're saying is true. I... Uh, as you read Bildad and Zophar's speeches, their arrogance just drips through everything they say, every word they speak. They were absolutely sure that they knew what they were talking about, and they were wrong at the same time. Absolute certainty and incorrectness. They pointed fingers, and they pinned the blame on others. There are people who will always want to blame other people for everything, that goes wrong they can never accept blame or accept the fault <clears throat> when things happen i cringe when i see well-known preachers and this happens all the time uh, i remember when a tornado came up and uh, did some damage and i don't remember the exact situation but but preachers were quick to say well this is because of this particular group of sinners God judged and sent this tornado, sent this hurricane because of this particular group of sinners. How do they know the inner workings, the secret things of God? Does God judge sin? Well, absolutely. Is it possible that God would send judgment on a nation because of our wickedness? It happens all throughout Scripture. 
But unless you are a prophet of God who received a direct message, it's best not to try to pretend that you know exactly what God is doing in certain situations. Eliphaz, uh, actually this is Bildad, in Eliphaz's speech, he just makes insinuations. But Bildad crosses a serious line in, uh, in his speech. And look what he says to Job. Can you imagine the knife that Job felt in his gut when Bildad said this to him? Since your children sinned against God, he gave them over to their rebellion. This is because of the wickedness. God not only took every possession you ever had, but he killed all of your children. Now, I don't know if his children, his children were not perfect. They did a little bit of feasting. But there's no evidence that they committed enough wickedness that God would have killed the lot of them. That kind of judgment seems reserved in the Word of God for pretty wicked groups of people. And he just says, well, let me tell you this, buddy. Your kids were so wicked that God wiped them out. What evil but he just wanted to play pin the tail on the someone other than me you know and he it was just so wrong but in the same light they were defensive and sensitive and when job can you imagine job responding in anger your kids deserved it job why would he get angry about that your kids deserve to die strangely that made him mad can you imagine? And he fought back. And they got sensitive and defensive. Have you ever noticed that people who are the quickest to blame are sensitive when they're blamed? Somebody who's always pointing the finger when you say, well, what about you? Well, how dare you? I see this all the time in, in interactions online. Someone who's like, well, this person's a heretic, and that person's a heretic, and that person's a heretic. And, and you say, well, I don't think that's biblically correct. How dare you say that to me? Very, people who are very judgmental are often very sensitive. In Job 11, 30, in Job 11 and, and I hope you have a Bible out. If you don't, you, you're going to need one here, because I'm not going to post every single verse. I'll post a few of them during this time. But uh, Job 11, 2 and 3, so far angrily defends himself in job 8 2 and 3 bildad had done the same but not quite as vocally as ophar is the zealous the angry one and he was the most you know for these he, he's the most vocal turnabout is not fair play they can make accusations they will not receive them when job answered back they belittled him and they insulted him when he didn't bow to their wisdom, they fought back with insults, with belittling words. Uh, they came to help Job. But it soon became about their pride, not Job's healing. Listen, you will never help somebody when it becomes about your pride. The greatest hindrance to the work of God in your life and the lives of others is pride. When your pride becomes the issue, you will never accomplish the work of God. In chapter 11, Zophar calls Job a babbler. You babbler! And asks him, if, are you able to discern the wisdom of God? This Job is the man who everybody came to to find the wisdom of God, and all of a sudden now, are you able to discern the wisdom of God? Now they're putting him down, and they're angry because... He challenged them. He didn't bow to their wisdom. And that leads to my final point about these men. They demanded that Job comply, that he acquiesce, acquiesce to their wisdom. It was essentially a bullying move. You see, these men were so spiritual, so wise, that they could offer Job hope and healing, but only if he acquiesced to what they said. 
It's my way or it's the highway to you know where, Job. Eliphaz told Job in chapter 5, verse 17, happy is the man whom God corrects. Once again, is that true? Sure. But he's wrong. What's he saying? He's saying, look, Job, if you will just repent, God will correct you and you'll be happy. He's wrong, but he's saying, if you'll just listen to me, you can be happy. In Job 8, 21 and 22, Bildad says, God will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with a shout of joy. Your enemies will be clothed with shame. The tent of the wicked will no longer exist. God will make you happy again. He'll make you laugh again. All he has to do is stop disagreeing with Bildad and repent of his sin. Zophar was the most passionate. He takes eight verses, chapter 11, verses 13 through 20, and he makes a series of promises to Job. Job's life would become brighter than the noonday sun. There would be hope and safety, and he won't be frightened anymore. All he has to do is admit that he was wrong and they were right. Listen, beware of anyone who tries to control your life, who wants full authority over you. Beware of a church that says, we have to have control of everything you do. Yes, there is biblical authority in homes and families, in a church. But when a church or a husband, a father, when they start demanding absolute authority and control over other people, they have stepped beyond biblical authority into a level of control that is essentially abusive when you demand inordinate authority over others, you're not seeking to glorify self, but you are taking a place that you do not deserve. We have a responsibility to one another, but we have one Lord. And authority is never meant to do anything but help people walk under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In churches that tell people, you have to do exactly what we say. Marry who we tell you to marry, live where we tell you to live, give what we tell you to give. That don't respect people's freedom under the lordship of Christ. Those churches are not biblical churches. They often claim to be the only biblical churches, but they're out of line. Now, i got to move on, because I want to get to the heart and soul of this message, which I, I should never make my last point the most important point. Uh, I know that's a tactical error, but it's one I make pretty often. Let's talk about Job's response to his friends. Uh, his responses, now they're understandable responses. There are four basic truths. Uh, as I said, Job makes long, his friend's speech, his Eliphaz's was kind of long, Bildad's was shorter, and Zophar was shortened to the point, uh, kind of screaming, so I, Job gives long speeches and repetitive, so I'm just kind of glean, gleaning some highlights from those speeches. But I want to say four things. First of all, Job saw his life as broken and empty. Uh, he gets no joy out of life anymore. He, he just, it's all gone for him. He begins his response to Eliphaz. He's, he's given his lament in chapter 3, and then Eliphaz basically says, stop whining, just repent and get it over with. And he starts again by saying in chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, uh, he says, if only my grief could be weighed and my devastation placed with it on the scale, then, I would, then it would outweigh the sand of the seas. That is why my words are rash. He says, I'm complaining because my life is broken and has lost all meaning. Uh, he's received criticism for his lament instead of sympathy. Instead of putting his arm around him and saying, look, Job, I understand. I, I can see what you've been through. I'll be here for you. Instead of being there as a friend, Eliphaz has thrown sand in his face and said, look, you did this, you caused this, and so it gets worse and worse and worse. In chapter 7, verses 6, 6 through 10, he says, and I remember this, I remember this from a Charlie Brown cartoon 
25, 30, 40 years ago. This was in a Charlie Brown cartoon. Uh, Anyone born of woman is short of days and full of trouble. He blossoms like a flower and then withers. He flees like a shadow and does not last. This is a man who is broken. And uh, in chapter 10, verse 1, he says, I am disgusted with my life. You ever been there? You don't have to raise your hand, but if, have you ever been there? I, yeah. Most of us have at some point or another. We just feel like life is short and full of trouble. It, uh, it's disgusting. There are times when we just lose our joy and we don't have any real desire to live. In that time, for, for seven days he sat and, and he couldn't feel a thing. He was numb. Have you ever broken a bone? I remember when I broke my arm back in high school basketball. I, it didn't hurt at first. There was a, you know, when I first broke it, I was laying there and I'm like, wow, it's weird, it doesn't hurt. And then all of a sudden it did. You know, right at first it's like, I, could, I knew, I, I, I felt it break, I saw it, but there was just kind of that, like, oh, wow, that does and then it did hurt, you know. Then I'm screaming. <laughs> you know, they're like, stop being a baby. It hurts! You know, I, I, there's that moment, and, and he, he, he sat there on the ash heap, and it didn't hurt, and all of a sudden it did. And his emotions went out of control. And he just let go of these negative emotions. In chapter 6, uh, let me just mention some of these emotions. I'm going to run through these real quick. They're all in chapter 6. If you want to open your Bible to chapter 6, I'm just going to run through these really quick so I can get to the last point, which is the biggest one. He said, I, I've, I've lost hope. He says, what strength do I have that I should continue to hope? I, I heard someone say one time, you can live 40 days without food. You can live uh, like three or four days without water. You can't live a minute without hope. When you lose track of hope, when you have no sense that God is going to carry you into the future, that's when it gets discouraging. When you look forward, you know, when, when, when COVID started, we thought, man, this, this could be a bad two or three months. Remember? This could be a, this could be a tough couple of months. That was the middle of March. We, we made the decision to shut down March 15th, and we thought this could be a, a couple of bad months that we're going to have, and now it's, you know, we're approaching Thanksgiving, and it's worse now than it was then. We're setting records every day. And I'm like, when's it going to end? Maybe one of these vaccines will work. But, you know, it, it, when you lose hope, when you lose hope, that's when you lose everything. And uh, he says, he starts to have in verse 14 of chapter 6, sort of an isolation and paranoia. He looks at his friends, and, and what he says is kind of true. He says, a despairing man should receive loyalty from his friends. In, in my, you know, I, my friends should have stood with me, and you guys are training your guns on me. But I've noticed that people in times of pain can be very paranoid, isolated, feeling lonely. Even when their friends come around them, they still feel lonely. They feel like nobody cares. Even when people try to show them concern, I've seen people who, I know many people tried to show them concern, and they're like, yeah, I don't, nobody really cares. Because that's what they're feeling inside. And sometimes people don't, but sometimes people do, and they just feel that way. He says in verses 24 and 25, he, and I'm not going to look at these scriptures, but he's just like, I wish you all would try to understand me. You, you just feel like nobody really knows what you're going through. And finally, he's angry at the injustice of it all. He's angry at, at the way things are going and how unjust things are. He says, don't be unjust. He's talking to God as much as to his friends. Uh, and then in... And then he vents his anger. We're told by psychologists that venting our anger is healthy, but did you know that the Bible says that venting our anger is unhealthy, that it's destructive, that it's one of the most harmful things we can do? 
I'll talk more about this as we go through the book, but I'll hint, you are to vent your anger to God. You take your anger to God and He heals your anger. He helps you through it. When you vent your anger at other people, you just tear down relationships. Uh, it's not good to let you, but in his anger and frustration, Job lost his filter, and he did what a lot of people do. They say, well, I don't care what anyone thinks. I'm going to let people know what I think. I'm going to start being honest. We call it being honest. I want to be honest, and I'm going to tell people what I really think. And anybody that agrees with you says yes, and anybody that doesn't gets offended. In chapter 7, verse 14, he said, Therefore I will not restrain my mouth. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible tells you to restrain your mouth. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Restrain your mouth. But now he's mad and he's hurt and he's lashing. Now he says, I'm not going to restrain my mouth. I will speak the anguish of my spirit and I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Look out, folks. In chapter 12, verse 2, you can just see how his words drip with sarcasm. And, uh, you know, don't be surprised if a person in pain says things that surprise you. That irony there is intentional. Don't be surprised if somebody you know who's in pain says something like, I can't believe she said that. I can't believe he said that. They'll say things Maybe they don't mean them. Maybe they're intending to shock. They'll, they'll lash out. Our job when someone's hurting is to be compassionate to them. Throw them some rope. Help them out. Now here's the big point. And uh, I wish we could turn the clock back a minute or two, but let's go. Job lost sight of the goodness of God. He lost sight of, this is where the rubber hits the road. He had lived his life with a deep and abiding sense that the world was run by a sovereign God who was good, who would protect him and bless him and watch over him. And now the poison in his soul was causing him to lose sight of this abiding sense that God was good and watched over him. That sense was gone. Look at some of the shocking things he says. I, Unfortunately, I had to pick like only two or three, but if you read through these chapters, you'll see there were maybe six or seven things that I noted in my notes, and I picked about two or three of them uh, to mention here. In Job chapter 6, verse 4, look what he says about God. This is the God who has blessed him, who has loved him. He says, the arrows of the Almighty have pierced me. God is a hunter. He's the deer. He's the prey. God is the hunter. His arrows have pierced me. My spirit drinks the poison that God, the poison of God's arrows. Yeah, I think he's, or maybe he's just changing metaphors. God is feeding me poison and I drink it. God's love is poured out on me, right? No. God's ter God is terrorizing me. God's terrors are arrayed against me. God is shooting at him, poisoning him, terrorizing him. In chapter 10, verse 2, he says God is prosecuting him. The Creator, our Father, our shield, our refuge, is now his prosecutor trying to ship him off to eternal prison, trying to destroy his life. Now look at chapter 7, verses 17 through 21. What is a mere human that you think so highly of him and pay so much attention? There needs to be a tone of sarcasm here, folks. You inspect him every morning and put him to the test every moment. And then in verse 20, he says, if I have sinned, what have I done to you? Watcher of humanity, why have you made me your target that I have become a burden to you? You know, this sounds like he's talking about how much God watches over him and loves him. He calls him the watcher of humanity. But he's sarcastic. He's talking about God more as a stalker. Why won't you? He actually says, look what he says in verse 19. I skipped verse 19. 
Will you ever look away from me or leave me alone long enough to swallow? He's asking God to leave him alone. Won't you please just leave me alone, God? Do you see how twisted things have become? The last thing any of us ever want is a loving God in heaven to leave us alone. He says this again in 1020. And in chapter 13, 21, he says, remove your hand from me. Don't let your terror frighten me. Stop, stop hurting me, God. Listen, there is nothing scarier than a sovereign God with complete control over the world who's out to get you. If you believe that God is out to get you, he has ultimate, you know, if, 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 if the government, you know, and back in Soviet Russia or communist China, the government has a- absolute control, and if they decide to get you, that's scary. But if there's a sovereign God who knows everything, sees everything, and he's out to get you, that is scary. That is terrifying. And this is how far Job has fallen in his anger. It's important to note, um, he'd have never gotten here if it hadn't been for his friends. If his friends had been loving friends, if they'd put their arms around him and said, we're here for you, we know God loves you. We'll see you through. We'll stand by. If they had done what they should have done, I don't think Job would have gotten to this point, but their constant accusations, their self-centeredness drove him more and more towards this place. But in the middle of this, what I want to close with is one glorious truth. Later on, I'm not sure what chapter it's in, Jerry, but I know my Redeemer lives. Might be in like 27 or 28, something like that. That's another glorious truth that we'll see. But in this chapter, chapter 9, verses 16, uh, verses 32 through 35, there is another glorious truth. In his caustic, sarcastic, angry time, Job hit on something wonderful. Now he holds this view of an angry God who's out to get him and destroy him, a God who is pursuing him, persecuting him, prosecuting him, looking to take him down. Uh, Now, Job's friends took truth and used it the wrong way. Job uses, uh, finds a nugget of truth in all of his wrong ideas. Job sees God in the wrong way, but in the middle of this, he sees a beautiful, wonderful, life-changing truth. You see, our God is angry about sin. He does hate sin. And we so often forget this. We go on our way, la di da di da di da Who cares about sin? Sin is no big deal. We act as if our sin doesn't matter to God. He couldn't care less. But all spiritual breakthroughs start with a sense of humility and repentance when we realize that God does hate sin and he will judge sin. And Job was right about that. He had an overinflated sense of his own righteousness. He knew, and he was right, that he didn't deserve this judgment. He had not done anything to cause God to bring this judgment on himself. God brought that because of this conflict with Satan for other purposes as well. But he was wrong, and he was wrong about the idea that God enjoys destroying us for our sins. You know, when I, in, in Senegal, they have the Bashin, the gods they worship out in the forests, in the jungles. And these Pashin are angry. And they go out there and they make sacrifices, not because they love the gods, but because they're afraid of the gods. They're afraid to come to Jesus because the Bashin will will hurt them. They're terrorized by the Bashin. They have to be appeased. They're afraid not to worship them. Our God is perfect. Our God is wonderful. And our God appeased our sin himself. Look at what Job said. When he was feeling like God was out to get him, he said this. 
he is not a man like me that I can answer him. He's saying, God's unfair. God won't listen to me. We can take, you know, I, I'd like to take him to court and prove that he's unjust. But he says, there is no mediator between us. There's no lawyer. There's no one I can get to defend me before God to lay his hand on both of us, to take, let him take his rod away from me so his terror will no longer frighten me. But that's exactly what happened. He called out for a mediator between him and God, and that's exactly what Jesus Christ was. God, Job realized in this moment that there was separation between him and God and that he needed a mediator. He was confused about it all. But in Job's despair and anger, he stumbled on the highest of truths. He'll actually come back to that later. We have a mediator. In all of the religions of the world, especially the native religions, they spend all their time trying to appease the gods and atone for what they've done wrong, to keep the gods from being angry. In our faith, God atoned for our sins against him with his son. You see, God is angry against our sins. Our sins do offend him, but he is not angry against us. He is for us. And that's what Job lost sight of. God is for us, and he sent his son to die for us. He is for us, not against us. He spent all of history to redeem us. And you can never come to that point that Job did where you believe that God has turned on you. Whatever else happens in this world, God is for us. And nothing can stand against us. And you can hold on to the most glorious truth in the world that God is for you. When the whole world is falling apart, God is for you. When darkness seems to hide his face, God is for you. When hell boils over, God is for you. And Job lost sight of this, and it took him down a dark, dark road. But God is for you. Because of Jesus Christ, we have a mediator. We have one who stood between God and sinful man and appeased, God, appeased God's wrath and, and, and dealt with our sin. And so we now can say, our God is for us, and the love of God flows freely in our lives. And so in the midst of all of our hopelessness, and I've been in all these places that Job has been, I've been there, but we can never be in the hopeless place that Job is because our God is an awesome God. Our God is faithful. Father, I pray that you would help us to always end up in a place of hope, even when there's sadness, even when there's hurt father when we are devastated by life when we're worn down by the constant drudge of this world help us to remember that there is hope in jesus christ and that you are for us in jesus wonderful name we pray amen